Scripture reading this morning is from the 13th chapter of Acts, verses 21 through 23. Paul here is preaching in the synagogue there in Antioch of Pisidia. Acts 13, starting with verse 21. And afterward they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, in whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, According to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. We want to welcome everyone, our members, and those of you who are visiting with us. It's, uh, it's good to have you here and uh, be able to worship our God with us, remember our Lord and Savior Jesus, and now... Open up God's Word and, uh, and, and uh, look at a portion of what He has told us, His message that He has revealed to us. As you can see by the title here, we're going to talk about a man after God's own heart. Now when you see that on the screen, my guess is most of you probably recognize that phrase and know who that's referring to. David is the one person in the Bible who's referred to as being a man after God's own heart. David is a man who rose from complete obscurity. And all the way up to be the king of Israel, and probably the greatest and the most famous king of Israel at that. But David's life, as we know well, was full of ups and downs. It seemed like David was either sailing or sinking in his life. And his life was primarily defined by interactions with two people. There are two people who we commonly associate with David, David and Goliath. Maybe the most famous story, one of the most famous stories in the Bible, and David and Bathsheba. But both of those showing both ends of the spectrum in which we see David's life being the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. You know, he went from an outcast in his own family, as we'll look at here in a moment, to being the hero of Israel, to then being a fugitive in his own country, to then being a great victor to then being an adulterer and a murderer and eventually being run out of his own kingdom and seeing his family fall apart before his eyes. But through all of this, his legacy remains, as Randy just read for us in Acts chapter 13, as folks hundreds of years, a thousand years later, were reflecting back upon David and who he was and what he meant and an integral part of Israel's history, his legacy was that he was a man after God's own heart, and he was the father, forefather, but often referred to as the father, Jesus was referred to as the son of David, the father to the most important person then who ever walked the face of the earth. So, first of all, I want to stop and think about this term for a moment, a man after God's own heart. What does it mean to be someone, a man after God's own heart? Well, we use this term today even, right? So if for whatever reason, you know, you are a, uh, you love White Castle sliders, and I don't know why that would be, but if you do, and let's say that I happen to have the same love, which I do not, but, you know, and I look at you and I realize that's something that you love, then I might say, there's a man or a woman after my own heart, right? They share a similar passion, a similar love, a similar interest, you know, as what I do. So the idea of being a man after God's own heart then is just that. That David was someone that God loved because he shared a heart like God's. He had a character like God's. He shared the same attributes and love and and, uh, desires that God had. When God looked at David, God saw a person who reminded him of his own nature and of his own character. Now, did you realize there are 66 chapters in the Bible, devoted to the story of David. There are 59 references to David in the New Testament. That's more airtime in the Bible than any other character with the exception of Jesus. So David gets a lot of airtime in the Bible. There's a lot devoted to his life and who he was and what his legacy was. He is, as we alluded to, part of the most exclusive genealogy in the Bible. 
as the forefather, as the father of David, or, or father of Jesus, excuse me. Yet, as we've already noted, David is far from perfect. In addition to being a great shepherd, and a great warrior, and a great king, he was an adulterer, he was a liar, and he was a murderer. So this brings me to the question that I've often struggled with. Why is that man then, why is he the only one in the Bible that God refers to as being a man after God's own heart? Well, I want to suggest this morning that the answer is found in two parts. The first part is, first of all, in who God is. And the second part of that answer as to why David was a man after God's own heart is then who David was. And so we're going to look at both of these factors this morning as we sort of survey the story of David briefly here. We're going to look at what we learn about God and then what we see about David and his character that might lend itself then to being a man that God calls someone who was after his own heart. Let's briefly review the story. I know this is a story that is very familiar to many of you, but maybe it'll be a good reminder. But I'm also going to use, as we survey the story of David here this morning, I'm going to use it as an opportunity to draw on some of these points, make some application from his life. You remember the first king, and and Randy read this. it's, It's noted in Acts chapter 13 as well, in verse 21. The first king of Israel was Saul. The people of Israel were tired of having God as their leader, You know, they wanted a leader like all the other nations around them. And they saw the other nations having kings. And so they said, we want one of those. And so God said, all right, you can have what you want. And he gave them a man after their own heart. A tall man, a handsome man, a great warrior, someone that looked the part of a king. And so Saul was anointed the first king of Israel. And things things went well for a short period of time at least. Saul won some battles. Saul seemed to be relatively meek and obedient there early on, but it was pretty soon that you learned just what what Saul's real character was. You know, Saul, we saw how thin-skinned and how jealous and how disobedient and foolish Saul was. He truly was a man after the people's own heart. And in 1 Samuel chapter 13, if you want to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel, we're going to spend a good bit of our lesson there. In 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14 then, after Saul had disobeyed God and offered a sacrifice that he wasn't permitted to offer, that was only for the priests, then Samuel, then God came through Samuel to Saul and said, you're done. You know, you blatantly disobeyed my command, you failed, and so I'm going to pick a new king, but I'm not just going to pick anyone. I'm going to pick 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14. I'm going to pick someone after my own heart. I'm going to seek a king who's after my own heart, God's own heart. Now, David was just a boy when God called him out of Bethlehem. God sent Samuel to this small, obscure town. Bethlehem, if you remember from Micah chapter 5, Bethlehem was was too little to even really be considered part of the the clan of Jerusalem, Micah 5 and verse 2 says. Bethlehem was an obscure, rural town. and, And interestingly enough, when Samuel shows up, The elders of the the people come and they're like, why are you here? You know, is something wrong? Are you coming in peace? Why in the world would God's prophet be going to an obscure place like Bethlehem? Well, that's where David was from. And Samuel went there because God had told him that was where he was going to go find this man after God's own heart. So he shows up and he wants to find, he wants to, he offers Jesse and his sons to come and join him for a sacrifice. And so Jesse brings his sons. And surely one of these is going to be this new king, the Lord's anointed. Well, as soon as Samuel sees the oldest, Eliab, Samuel thinks it's got to be him. Tall, handsome, strapping man, that's got to be the Lord's anointed. But look what God says in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees, not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God quickly reminds Samuel, stop looking at the outside. I don't care about what somebody looks on the outside. I don't care about the external. I care about the internal. And this is our first point about who God is. 
God cares about the inside of a person rather than what's on the outside. Now think about that, right? We see that throughout the Bible. I mean, jump to the New Testament and the Pharisees. How did Jesus describe the Pharisees? Being whitewashed tombs. Dead on the inside, but looking really good on the outside, right? You can, you can paint a tomb white all you want, but it's still a dead person in there, right? It's still rotten and deteriorated and decayed in there. That was how God described the Pharisees. They looked good on the outside. They said the right things. They wore the right clothes. You know, they tried to appear good before men, but the reality was they were dead inside. They were deteriorated inside. You know, think about Jesus' own appearance, right? When God sent His own Son into the world, how did He come? Remember Isaiah 53? You know, he came with no stately form or majesty that men should be attracted to him or look upon him, right? You know, he came like one from whom men hide their face. Jesus didn't come to impress people on the outside. It was what was inside of him that impressed people. This is a critical lesson, you know, for people who want to please God. But it's a hard lesson. It was hard in their culture, clearly, and it's hard in our culture. Did you know, in this country alone, we spend $16 billion, with a B, billion dollars, $16 billion on cosmetic surgery to try to make the outside look better. You know, Samuel took one look at Eliab, and he thought, this must be the Lord's anointed. You know, I can relate to that. Imagine all of us can probably relate to this in some degree. If you think back to when you were single, or maybe those of you who are still single, you know, I remember, uh, you know, a, a pretty girl walks into class. Well, that must be the Lord's anointed. You know, that's the one for me, right? Or, you know, then, you know, a new, new girl moves into the neighborhood. She must be the Lord's anointed. There she is, right? Or especially, you know, she walks into the church building. That's got to be the Lord's anointed for me. For 15 plus years, you know, that went on and on and on. And then finally... Finally, God blessed me with someone who was not just beautiful on the outside, but beautiful on the inside. And that was his message all along, right? Quit looking at the outside. Quit looking at the appearance. What's inside is what really matters. It's a lesson we got to learn, but it's a hard one. It's one our society struggles with. God cares about heart, the hearts of people, not our physical appearances. So, back to our story here in 1 Samuel 16. Six more of, De of Jesse's sons parade by, and none of them. None of them are the ones that the Lord has chosen as his anointed. And so, you know, Samuel's probably confused here, it appears. And he's like, is this all? You know, God said the, the Lord's anointed was going to come from your, one of your sons, Jesse. Is there not anybody else? And notice in verse 11, you know, it's almost as if Jesse regrettably says, well, there is one more, you know, but he's a shepherd. He's out in the field, you know, with the sheep. Now, I want you to look at that term there. It's that Jesse said, uh, there remains yet the youngest. Now, I looked this, that word up in my Strong's Concordance, because I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but the Hebrew, that Hebrew word for youngest there means diminutive in quantity, size, or number, or in age, or importance, least or lesser one. So you realize what Jesse's saying there? Now, it could be he's solely referring here to his youth, that he was, because we, we know from other passages, it does appear that David was the youngest of his sons. But that word there, the idea there is the least of my sons, the lesser of my sons. And we remember in the next chapter, you know, when, when Jesse sends um, hit David out while, while his sons are in battle, his three oldest sons are in battle with the Philistines, Jesse, uh, Jesse sends David to take them bread and water. You remember when he comes to them? Remember what Eliab again, the oldest, says to him? He says, basically, what in the world have you left the sheep for? You know, you're a selfish and conceited and hateful young, you know, kid, basically. Get back there and take care of the sheep. Clearly, David wasn't exactly popular in his own household. Amongst his brothers, maybe even amongst his, his own parents, at least his dad. And so I want to think about, you know, we've, we've alluded to some of these characteristics of, of who David was. You know, despite being an outcast in his own family, he was the favorite of God. And Samuel anoints him as being the next king over Israel. And, and one, more, one more point here about, you know, this idea of who David was as it relates to this, this um, idea of internal versus what's on the outside versus what's on the inside. You know, when David gets anointed king in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, 
uh, in verse uh, 12 and 13. He doesn't all of a sudden put on a crown. He doesn't all of a sudden go live in a palace. He doesn't all of a sudden start wearing royal clothes, start walking around saying, bow down to me, I'm the king in waiting. He doesn't go seeking fame and fortune. No, he goes right back to the field. He goes right back to being a shepherd. He goes right back to serving how he was before. You know, God loves ordinary people. God loves people for who they are, not for what's on the outside, not for how much money they have, not for how popular they are, not for how many possessions they have, not for how good they look. God loves people for what's on the inside. And that's why God loved David. It wasn't because he came from a wealthy family. He was poor. He tells us that. It wasn't become he, because he was famous or popular or well-liked. No, God loved David because of his heart. And we see some of that heart come out then in the next story in 1 Samuel 17 with Goliath, right? You know, I think we overlook this sometimes, but David's faith was such an impressive part of who he was. You know, whether it was the lion and the bear to protect his sheep, whether it was as a boy still walking up to the most powerful, largest probably man on the face of the earth who nobody wanted to get near and throwing a, you know, taking a slingshot, to go fight him, whether it was all this, you know, the, the fleeing from Saul and, you know, and relying on the Lord, David's faith was such an impressive part of who he was. So who was David? David was a lowly, ordinary person. He wasn't chasing fame or power, but he was a person with deep-seated faith in the Lord. David was rich on the inside, even if he wasn't always on the outside. And so I would suggest that's one reason why David was a man after God's own heart. Well, let's continue our story. All right, so David's killed Goliath. You know, he's a hero in Israel now. But this fame doesn't bode well for him because Saul sees it and Saul doesn't want any of it. Saul doesn't like the fact that David is popular, more popular than him. And so Saul turns on David. But Saul needs David. He needs him because David, if you look in chapter 18... Uh, uh, yeah, chapter 18 and like verses 12 down through 30. We're not going to read all of this. But David, Saul put him in charge of a thousand men and David was incredibly successful as a, as a leader of, of part of Saul's army. Everything David touched, God was working through him and blessing. And Saul saw this. And so he knew he needed David. And yet, through all that, we see Saul over and over and over again in spite of the fact David becomes his son-in-law, in spite of the fact that David is his best servant, in spite of the fact that David is, God is blessing David and, and causing Saul to prosper because of David, Saul's fear and hatred leads him to basically spend the next many years chasing David all over Palestine trying to kill him, going whatever lengths it took to try to bring David down. But here's what I want you to notice about David through all that. In spite of Saul's continued attempts to harm David, what does David do? David consistently demonstrates incredible grace and mercy towards Saul and love towards Saul, and he refuses to speak poorly about him. He refuses to take the opportunities that are basically laid right in front of him to hurt Saul, to even kill Saul. He doesn't try to usurp the kingdom from clearly somebody who's lost his mind and is not serving well in his role as king. No, David doesn't do any of those things. He patiently waits on the Lord, respecting and honoring Saul through all of that. David was faithful even as Saul was not. I want to just look at a couple of passages here. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, Look at verses 12 through 14. We were alluding to this just a moment ago. Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and appointed him as his commander of a thousand. So David went out and came in before the people, and David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. Now jump down to verses 22 and 23. Then Saul commanded his servants, Speak to David secretly, saying, Behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke these words to David. But David said, he didn't say, 
Well, of course, I'm worthy to be your son-in-law. No, he said, is it trivial, trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law? Since I am a poor man and lightly esteemed, he said, who am I, Saul? Who am I that you would offer me this wonderful honor to be able to marry one of your daughters? Jump down to 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verses 4 through 7. This is one of at least two occasions where basically Saul is handed right to David to be able to kill him. Look at verses 4 through 7. David and his men are in a cave. And Saul, who's chasing David to try to kill him, comes into the cave to relieve himself. And look at verse 4. The men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. So David arose, cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly, and it came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose and left the cave and went on his way. Day, all David did was cut off a part of his robe. And he felt bad about that, that he had done that to the Lord's anointed. His men are trying to kill Saul. David feels bad about even cutting off the edge of his robe. And then when Saul does end up dying in 2 Samuel chapter 1, in verses 17 through 27, after many more, after David suffered much more at the hands of Saul, what does he do? He doesn't celebrate. He doesn't rejoice in Saul's death. No, he sings a song of mourning for Saul and Jonathan in 1 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel 1, verses 17 through 27. He grieves over Saul's death. You know, that takes an impressive amount of character for somebody who hates you that much and has mistreated you to that degree that you continue to love them that you continue to show mercy and grace to them and that you're so good to them that's who David was that's who David's heart was that's why he was a man after God's own heart well after being a fugitive on the run for many years you know Saul's time finally comes to an end and he's killed in battle, as we just mentioned. And David is instituted as king. And David's reign is a rousing success. He expands the kingdom almost twice what it was before he took over. You know, while it was during Saul's reign. You know, he they basically defeats all their enemies. He establishes Jerusalem and builds a capital city in Jerusalem. He brings the Ark of the Covenant and forms you know, the tabernacle to Jerusalem. He reestablishes Judaism, essentially, you know, there in the worship of the Lord. And he's very popular. And by all accounts, things are going great. But as we noted earlier, David is far from perfect. And the peace and the success didn't continue. And it all started with his sin with Bathsheba. You know, we don't need to recount the story. We know what happens. David sees Bathsheba, long lusts after her, takes her. She's married to a commander, one of the leaders of his own army, one of his most loyal servants. But he takes her. He commits adultery with her. She gets pregnant. So he's got to try to find a way now to cover it up. So to do that, ultimately... You know, he lies multiple times over and ends up bringing Uriah, her husband, home from battle. And then ultimately, when he can't get him to do what he wants to be able to hide this and cover this up, send him back to the front lines of battle to be killed. And sure enough, he is. And from there, three of David's sons die in the years that follow. A fourth dies soon after David passes away. His family fractures in all over, his closest advisors and friends and even son rebel against him. He gets run out of his own kingdom by his own son who's trying to kill him. And even on his deathbed, another of his sons is trying to usurp the kingdom from Solomon who he had designated to be the one to succeed him. David's life was not pretty in many ways. But we talked about how David was faithful even when Saul was not. Who is God? Well, God is faithful even when David 
was not. Turn to Psalm 89. You know, this, is, this gets back to my question, right? Why is this man a man after God's own heart? Well, look at Psalm 89. And we're going to look at verses 19 through 29. This is a psalm of David, so this is something David, that David wrote. Look how he describes God's faithfulness. Beginning, Psalm 89, beginning in verse 19, Once you spoke in vision to your godly ones and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant, and with my holy oil I have anointed him, with whom my hand will be established, and my arm also will strengthen him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. But I shall crush his adversaries before him, and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him. And in my name his horn will be exalted. And I shall also set his hand on the sea, and his right hand on the rivers. And he will cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation." I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever. And my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. God said, David, I know who you are. And I see your sin. And I know what you've done. But I am faithful my faithfulness will be with you. And I will keep my covenant with you forever. I will establish you forever. I will establish your descendants forever and your throne as the days of heaven. You know, there may be no characteristic of God that is more impressive. There's a lot of impressive characteristics of God, don't get me wrong. But, you know, but when you think about God's faithfulness, to his people. It's so impressive. You know, the story of the Bible is over and over again how mankind sins against God, the one, the very one who made us, who gave us life. We sin against him over and over. We disregard him over and over. And he would be perfectly in his right to give up on us, to punish us, to cast us off forever. But he doesn't. He continues to love us. He continues to seek after us. He continues to seek to bring us back into a relationship with Him. That is the story of the Bible. God continually seeking to bring His people back into fellowship, back into a right relationship with Him, all the way through sending His own Son so that we could ultimately achieve that. And that was so true for David. How grievously... David sinned against God. But despite that, God remained faithful to David, even when David wasn't. He patiently waited on David to confess and to repent and to come back to him. But this does bring us to our next point, because while God is faithful to everyone, not everyone ends up in a, rel in a right relationship with God. So who is it? that ends up in a right relationship with God. Well, this gets to our next point. It's those who have a humble and contrite heart. We know that God forgives those who have a humble and a contrite heart. At least five times in the Bible, some version of what is quoted in, or what is mentioned in James 4 and 1 Peter 5, you know, this idea that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble is mentioned at least five times throughout the Bible. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble, forgives the humble, extends mercy to who? To those who are humble. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, God tells us that He is faithful to forgive and to cleanse us when? When we confess our sins, when we admit that we're wrong. When we are humble and contrite, that is when God forgives. And the contrast between Saul and David on this point maybe, you know, most clearly exemplifies, you know, what the stark contrast between the two of them. You know, let's compare the two of them for just a moment. You know, go back to Saul's sin, right? Saul's sin doesn't, sins don't appear nearly as grievous as David's. I mean, Saul, after all, in chapter 13, I mean, he offered a sacrifice to God. Now, he wasn't authorized to do that, so he disobeyed, but 
He wasn't killing somebody. I mean, he was trying to worship God, right? In chapter 15, Saul had carried out most of God's command to, to destroy the Amalekites. He just hadn't killed them all. He had spared the king and a few of their flock and some of the best of their herds, right? So, but Saul, his reaction, his response to being confronted with being disobedient is what's telling. Remember in 1 Samuel 15 when Samuel came to him? He blamed everybody else. He blamed the people. He blamed, the, he blamed whoever, was in, whoever he could think of but refused to demonstrate any sort of a humble or contrite heart. Now contrast that with David, who we've already said. You know, David was a murderer and a liar and an adulterer, and we haven't even talked about, you know, the end of his life where he, you know, went out and did a census of the people and ultimately then brought a plague on the Israelites that cost 70,000 Israelites their lives. David did some grievous things. So how come Saul had the kingdom stripped from him? And how come God abandoned him? And how come we never hear about him again while David then has this legacy of being a man after God's own heart? Well, I think Psalm 51 is the reason. Turn to Psalm 51 for a second. It's maybe the, the second most famous psalm of David after Psalm 23. Psalm 51, beginning in verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. David recognized his sins and David mourned over his sins and what he's done to God. This goes back to 1 John 1 and 8 and 9, right? David confessed his sins. He admitted when he was wrong, and it grieved him, and he knew how he had hurt God. Let's continue. Look at verses 6 through 9, or, or 5 through 9. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin. My mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. David knows the only place he can turn is to the Lord. That God is the one who can cleanse him. God is the one who can forgive him. God is the one who can make him white as snow. But he also knows he doesn't deserve anything more than death. Let's continue. Verses 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. David recognized he needed to do more than just get rid of the bad. And so he requests a clean and a pure heart. And he states his desire for inner change and renewal. That's repentance, right? That he's changing. He knows he needs God's help to change. And then verses 13 through 17. We read verse 13. I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will be converted. Verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, that you will not despise. David's response to God's forgiveness, he teaches others about it in verse 13. He sings of it. He sings of God's righteousness in verse 14. And he praises God in verse 15. But I especially want us to notice verses 16 and 17. The key to responding to our sin is not just to throw another lamb on the fire. Or in our case, not just to offer up another generic prayer asking God for forgiveness. No, the key to forgiveness is to have a broken and a contrite heart. 
but leads to godly sorrow, which leads then to repentance and to change. That's what Saul failed to understand. And that's why David was a man after God's own heart. Because David had a humble and a contrite heart. If God can forgive David, then God can forgive anyone. But it takes this sort of heart. It takes a broken heart recognizing what we've done. Recognizing what we've done to God. And not just recognizing it then, but pleading with God to forgive us, to make us new, and to change our hearts. And then actually changing. And then actually repenting. That's what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, right? A godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that leads to change. It's not that we grieve for what we've done, but that we're moved to change. It doesn't mean that we're just sorry for the consequences, but we sorrow over the wickedness of our sin. And we're sorry enough to change our lives. But that does bring us to another point related to this, which is the fact that even though God forgives the humble and the contrite heart, that doesn't mean He's going to remove the consequences, the earthly consequences. You know, as we noted earlier, David suffered grievously. You know, David, I mean, I can't imagine. You know, he lost four of his sons after his sin with Bathsheba. His entire family crumbled before his eyes. You know, but his response to God's punishment, I think, is another testament to why he was a man after God's own heart. Flip back to 1 Samuel 12 for just a moment. Or, sorry, 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12, after Nathan confronts David with his sin, and David realizes what he's done, he realizes his sin. Then look in verse 15. The Lord struck this child this was the, the newborn child that Bathsheba bore. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. So David inquired of God for the child, and he fasted, and he went and lay on the night, uh, lay on, all night on the ground and jumped down to verse 18. It happened on the seventh day the child died. The servants of David were afraid to tell him the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he wouldn't listen to our voice. How then can we tell him the child is dead? He might do himself harm. But when David saw his servants whispering together, David perceived the child was dead. So David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is. So David arose from the ground. He washed and anointed himself. He changed his clothes. And he came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Now, I don't know about you. You know, I can't imagine losing a child, but I also worry that if I did, I may not have the love and the trust in God to be able to respond like David did. I don't know that the first thing I would do would be to pick myself up and go worship God. And I'm ashamed of that. That's not good. I've got to, I've got to get better in that. But again, I think that's why David was a man after God's own heart. You know, not only did he have a humble and contrite heart, he accepted the consequences of his sins. And that's the heart for God. You know, he didn't despair. He didn't give up. He didn't blame God. He didn't spiral further into self-pity or, or other sin. No, he accepted the consequences of her sin, and he worshiped the Lord. And I think this brings us to our last point about who God is and who David was. Because above all else, one thing mattered to David. David desired to be with God, seeking the Lord and being with Him. Two more passages we're going to look at briefly. Psalm 27 and verse 4. Psalm 27 and verse 4. Another psalm of David. Notice what he says here. One thing, Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate 
in his temple. There was one thing that mattered to David above all else. Seek the Lord and to dwell in his house, to be with him. Psalm 63 and verses 1 through 3. Psalm 63, beginning in verse 1. O God, you are my God, and I will seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and a weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary and to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. David describes his seeking for God as if he's in a desert with no water in anywhere in sight, and that's, that's the amount that he would long for water in that setting, is how much he longs and seeks after the Lord. That's who David was. You recall maybe the happiest moment in his life that we read about was when he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. You remember that? You know, David, when the Ark of the Covenant, which is God's dwelling place, symbolic of God's dwelling place, right? When God is moving into Jerusalem where David lives, figuratively, remember David leapt and rejoiced and sang and praised God all through the streets of Jerusalem. That's how much he loved God, wanted to be with God. There's countless other examples of this in David's life, but those are just a couple. You know, David was a man who from an earthly perspective seemingly had it all. You know, he was probably the richest, most powerful person in the world. He had the physical attributes. He was handsome. He was well-built. He was personable. He became popular. He was well-spoken. He was brave. He was a mighty warrior. He was a hero among his people. But what was David's legacy? None of those things. That's not why David was remembered. No, David was remembered because he was a man after God's own heart. David was remembered because of his desire and his search for, and him finding an intimate and a close relationship with, him, with the Lord. So, this brings us then, well, what, what about God? What about God? Well, we know, from God's perspective, only one thing matters. He tells us that in Matthew 6, right? Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. We talked about this a couple Wednesday nights ago when I gave an invitation, the story of Mary and Martha, right? You know, Martha was distracted by serving and by preparing food. And what did Jesus say to, to, to Martha? Only one thing matters, and that's the Lord. You know, from the beginning of, of God's law, going all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, what was the foremost commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And Jesus reinforced that. In the new law. God doesn't care how much money we have. God doesn't care how many possessions we have. God doesn't care how many friends we have. He doesn't care how high up we move in the corporate or the political ladder. He cares about whether we love him with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. So David's life was a roller coaster filled with ups and downs. And I think this is maybe why David's so relatable for us. While our highs might not be as high as David's were, and our lows hopefully aren't as low as David's were, I think we can all relate to David. But most importantly, the question's going to be, can we relate to him in that is our heart one that God will find as being one that reflects his nature and his character? Is David's legacy going to be our legacy? Where God says of us one day, that was a man or a woman after my own heart. That's the important question, is whether our legacy is going to extend through eternity or whether it's going to end when this world ends. But what an incredible thought that you and I can have a heart like David, a heart like God. And I would encourage us to think about who David was, but more importantly, think about who God is and how we can be more like him. Well, that's the lesson this morning. I hope that we'll be impressed by who God is. And I hope we'll be motivated and driven to become more like him. If you're not a Christian, though, you haven't started that journey yet. If you're not a Christian, you haven't put on Christ yet, well, that's the beginning of the journey of having a heart like God. And so we offer you that opportunity this morning. If you need to be baptized into Jesus, you have the opportunity to come forward this morning. If you need the prayers of the congregation,
you have sin in your life or you have things that you would like to state publicly that you'd like the congregation to pray for, we offer the opportunity to come forward this time as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Who am I?